let me start off by maybe giving you some uh, some sobering and depressing news to start the day. All right. So one of the things that is on an increasing trend is about anxiety, depression, and suicides among the young people are rising globally. I have some really depressing statistics for the next slide. And it, it really shocked me. Uh, and it's a trend that is not sustainable. So we can be talking a lot about technology, education, but if we have young people commuting suicide, and I think you just heard there was a massive suicide when the recent results were released, uh, this is not something that's, uh, that we should accept. I was really surprised, and this is globally. This is not just something that is happening in India. I'm not, uh, India is of course right there at the top, but it is a global phenomenon for both the depression, suicides, as well as this intolerance and violent extremism. I remember coming into Delhi, taking up the position in 2014, and in a, I think in 2015, there was a survey done by actually an NGO from Bangalore on about nearly over 1,000 over young people from India, across the young people from ages of 15 to about 25, across different educational uh, fields. And the level of intolerance was surprising and shocking, where more than 60% felt that there was a place for women, there was a place for men. Many of them felt that violence should be used when necessary. Many actually wanted, were not too supportive of democracy and wanted autocracy. Uh, many felt that interracial marriages should not be encouraged. It was all, all downward trends. When we're talking about the 21st century, we're supposed to be progressive and liberal. And when I tell you about a little bit about the program, I hope you find it a little bit innovative, very much along the lines that has been discussed earlier in the presentation, but with a fundamental philosophical twist. And I think that's a very important twist that you need to take into account as well. And then, of course, we have the global wicked problems. Climate change is here to stay. We still have some people still, uh, still debating about climate change. Uh, it is hopefully a minority, a powerful minority, but still a my, hopefully a minority. Outlier, I hope, as well, with a span of four years. <laughs> uh, then we have issues of migration, where many people think that migration happens because people wish it. In most cases, they don't. They actually are very comfortable where they are, but they've been forced to migrate through violence, through displacement, through exclusion, and it's an increasing phenomenon. It puts on a lot of social tension across the people, the migrants, as well as the people who are accepting the migrants. And then, of course, the fourth one is the cost of education, which is becoming now a private good. Education has always been considered as a social public good. But the way privatization is happening, and when we talk about inclusiveness, an interesting example was that, so I always use my son as an as a example, and he's been watching some of my presentations, and we got together for a family vacation back in Canada this summer, and he was saying, you know, Papa, you've been using me quite a bit. I think I need to get some financial remuneration for this. <laughs> uh, but when I talk about private, uh, when it's a private girl, he was diagnosed with dyslexia, and acute dyslexia very early on. And one of the things that we had to do is that because it, it was such an acute level, he had to go to a special school. He couldn't have been accommodated within a present school. So there's a big debate now even going on in India in terms of under the whole notion of inclusiveness that these kids not, should not be pushed into a private school or a, a special school but should be mainstreamed within, within schooling systems. And I'm sure you must have also had the discussions. My counter is, if that's the case under the argument of inclusiveness, 
then we should close all private schools which are based on exclusivity of wealth. And then the discussion stops. So something that we should just keep in the back of the mind. These are the statistics that I wanted to show you. 25% of children between the ages of 13 and 15 have some form of depression in India. How many of you are shocked by this number? Or most of you are sort of saying, yeah, we know, we know about that. Let me see a show of hands. Those who are shocked. About 50. Well, actually, the majority are not shocked at all. Okay. Okay, so the next question is, are we willing to live with this? How many of you say, well, yeah, it's okay. The notion of sustainability, this is not a sustainable trajectory. And 800,000 people between the ages of 15 to 20 are dying by suicide every year globally. This is a global trend, not just India, but it's a global trend. And a primary driver, is not the only driver, but a primary direct driver is the education system that we have. I call it the most flawed system that we have. I call it the, the sector that has not changed over the last 300 years. I always say if you take a teacher 300 years ago and put the teacher right now, except for a few gimmicks here and there, that person will be extremely comfortable. Because it's the, we do it business is as usual. So this is the current system as we have. It's regimented. That's the system that I went through. The system that my kids have gone through has slightly changed, but still, I would say, re regimented to a certain extent. And I say instrumentalists by nature. What do I mean by instrumentalists? What I'm saying here is that they, the goal is purely from an instrumental perspective of what education can offer and this is where I would differ with maybe what the essence was at the earlier presentation for jobs uh, for each particular individual. I'm not, I don't think there are some basic competencies, the jobs of the future, we have no clue what those jobs are. I never thought that I would be doing what I was going to be doing at this right now things have evolved is constantly evolving what we need to provide is equip them with the skills that they can maneuver this ever-changing landscape that's what the education system has to do it has to provide the skills where if you go and become a historian and you sort of get excited but then start thinking about and being introduced to aerospace and says that really excites me I want to become a rocket scientist he can just change because he has those competencies. He has competencies that will not prevent him by getting frightened about mathematics. Because he is driven by the passion of the subject and therefore the tools, in this case mathematics is not a problem. I just go and learn it. Most of my life I've spent basically working on systems theory, building e human systems with ecological systems. In that, we have these assessments where we could do, bring in all the latest science. It's, it's driven by science and evidence. What I find surprisingly in the education sector is that there is very little science that has been brought into the whole teaching, the whole field of pedagogy. And most educators agree with me. And there's a lot of resistance to that. When I bring a group of neuroscientists who are working on the science of learning and educators from the traditional education departments, they don't talk to each other. And it's such an exciting thing when you do and watch them interact. And it kind of addresses many of the limitations that we talk about our present system. So it's about storytelling. Believe me, you can actually teach maths with storytelling. And it has relevance. Then you see the beauty of the of the subject. Narrative based. So an example was I came from the old school system, 
uh, went to the math stream, I was able to do differential calculus with the eyes closed on some of the most complex equations, six pages, finding solutions and stuff, but never had a clue what the hell it all stood for. Took a class when I was in graduate school, took a class in aerospace, and then they talked about differential calculus and how they take the rockets to moon and back using differential calculus. It's like, wow. Now you know what the first the first orders were, what was the second orders were, what was the steady states were, what was the perturbations were, what was the implications of such a thing. And then later on, when you sort of then saw how climate change is explained using those mathematics, again then you see the relevance. I'm not saying that you have to do that for a grade one or a grade two, but you can have those kind of examples. And as teachers, I'm sure you know that you use some of those. But if you weave in with characters, with a story, with, uh, with narrative and case studies, it becomes exciting for the kid. So guess what? On the flight here, I was playing our game called World Rescue that we had developed on the SDGs. And I saw this, I was sitting beside this young lady and she was like looking and saying, hey, oh, this gray haired guy playing with a, with a video game. And it was, it was, we built it for our K. I think it was for it was for ages eight to twelve. I was I found it fascinating because I couldn't get past level three. <laughs> so it's failure, 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 and stuff like that. Uh, but it taught you know it talked about some of the SDGs. It talked about some of the migration. It, it was doing some of the mathematics because we have a curriculum built around it. So I'm building up on how what what are the kind of stuff that we do at the institute. Digital pedagogies. We, we make a point that the digital field should not be just seen as a transmissive platform where you just is used to deliver. But it actually is a pedagogy by itself. It actually is able to create new learning neural networks. And it does. Reflections. Part of the empathy, uh, empathy training on terms of reflecting on what happened. <coughs> games and gamification, a lot of games. Games takes away the need for assessment. Games allows you to be self-paced. So you are within yourself, right? So imagine you're doing a maths course. The first thing they say is give you a computer, play the game, and if you finish level six, means you have learned all these outcomes of algebra. And do it at your pace. You fail, it throws you back. Gives you incentives to learn more. And you so that's the kind of ideology that we are building into most of the stuff that we have been. The research shows it's a, it's a social brain. And there are two dimensions to that. Next slide, please. So you have a biologically too, the rational and the emotional. I don't use the word cognitive because everything is cognitive. Even the emotional is cognitive because it is in within our brains. And so it's cognition. So I want to make the distinction between rational, which intellectual, and the emotional. And what we have focused primarily over the last 300 years of education has been focusing on the rational, the banking system, knowledge, 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 knowledge. The emotional dimension related with that knowledge has been ignored. But when we make decisions, so when we Akash was talking about changing behavior, changing mindsets. The decision is influenced by the emotions as well. Three pounds, central, nervous, uh, central command system. Now what also the science has shown is that those neural networks are constantly changing. So they call it neuroplasticity. So it's not fixed. As you learn, as you train, new neural networks emerge, all neural networks disappear. It's constantly changing. The highest rate, of course, is during the adolescence to the 25, 26-year-old. That's the highest rates of return. Right? So people like me, it's 
the margins are very small. Interestingly, that's a very re recent discovery by the neuroscientists. Because a lot of the conventional uh, thought was that it was fixed. And the neuroplasticity, the fact that it, you create new neural networks offers this huge potential of intervention. But what we have focused, as I said, was completely on the rational. Next slide, please. Rational and the intellectual has really been focused. That's the latest development of the human brain. The human brain. That's the most recent development that sets, apart, sets us apart from other species. This is the thinking. Then, going deep into the, the inside, the limbic part, these are the attention, regulation, and sensory. This is the emotional brain. Goes in right hand. So we were never able to see that until recent technolo technological uh, improvements where they do functional MRIs, where they can see actually the networks. So they did one on mine and it was completely blank. So they're hoping that in the five years, they're going to do one when I leave next year to see if there's been any changes. I, I, I said, hold your breath, don't hold your breath. So, so what we have is the next slide. Next slide. It's this system that needs to make these connections. A system that creates the neuroplasticity with this new neural networks that are constantly between these, the rational brain and the emotional brain. And what we call it at the institute, next slide please. Next slide. Firing the Gandhi neurons. We picked this up from VC Ramachandran, who's a neuroscientist at UC San Diego, and he talked about the whole notion of mirror neurons, empathy neurons, and he called them the Gandhi neurons. But what we think is you need to create a network. And so we call it the firing the Gandhi neurons in, in the sense that they are not going to be there. They are there, but you need to train them and activate them. So the way that we at the Institute have taken in our work program is that we have stepped away from just talking about Gandhi. We have, talked about, we have stopped from sort of just telling about what his thoughts were, what his philosophy was. But what we are trying to do is kind of recreate the kind of neural networks that we think that he had through his whole philosophy of experimentation, philosophy of inquiry, philosophy of empathy, philosophy of compassion. And so that's our program is focused on firing those Gandhi neurons. And then the approach. And then I'm moving towards the digital dimension. So this is the, the social emotional learning approach where we have it on mindfulness. So mindfulness activities here are primarily focused on developing the emotion and the self-regulation. So within yourself, as well as in interacting with the others. So when you come back to the brain, one of the things that always happens is, uh, this was developed, this was found very recently, what they call the amygdala hijack. The amygdala is the one that is really reactive. The fight, flight, the three Fs. Fight, flight, Peace. right? But actually, the one that nobody wants to always say, and I'll leave you to go and find what that is. Uh, so, what we, so the mindfulness is about the self, empathy is about with the other, the compassion is to do something about it, because what scientists have found, and this came from a lab in, in Germany, when they took a group of people with empathy training, what happens is that if you don't, if you don't have a compassion training linked with it, you go into empathy distress. And that could be quite dangerous. It leads to depression and suicide. Empathy distress means you feel for the other. And when, I, and when you start, talk about empathy, it's not about just uh, listening to the other. It's to put yourself in that person's shoe. So you have to, and it's very difficult. It's extremely difficult. It needs a lot of training to do that. 
But what you sort of say is, you feel and you, you understand, but you cannot do anything about it, you go into an empathetic distress. So the compassion training is sort of trains you to then take action. So that's the action part, the agency part. And that's extremely important. But why did we have critical inquiry? Because we did a thought experiment where you can be mindful, you can be empathetic, you can be compassionate, and yet be a suicide bomber. And so the critical inquiry, the rational part is important as well. Because it is a constant dialogue between the emotional and the, ration, and the rational brain. They don't work in isolation. What we have taken for assumption is that the emotional doesn't need training. What we have now learned is that the emotional also has to be trained, as we have been training the frontal neocortex.